Hello everyone. We've got some positively ginormous systems to look at today. And these are of course from that massive Franklin E. Waste Hall. And the tallest towers are about 24 inches high or 60 centimeters roughly. And just to give you a sense of scale, here's a baby AT, which looks absolutely minuscule next to these beasts. So without further ado, let's tear into these. All right, I'm gonna start with this machine because it seems to be the oldest of the three. So we've got a 10 speed CD-ROM drive up here. And I initially thought that this was some kind of tape drive, but now that I look closer, that is something entirely different. See, so we've got the turbo button here, and of course the reset button, and has the seven segment clock speed indicator. And it has an IP address written on the top of the machine. And that makes me think this must have been some kind of server. And furthering my server suspicion, it looks like this is actually a removable hard drive. So let's see if I can get it out of there. Hopefully this plastic doesn't break. It looks like this moves outward, there we go. And yep, that's a hard drive in there. Looks like some kind of Western digital hard drive. Now let's see what the connector looks like. Wow, that is weird. So this has to be an IDE drive. Gotta say, I haven't seen very many easily removable IDE drives. So that's very interesting. I'm just gonna go ahead and put that back in there. And having a look around the back, we see the rarity of rarities. It has the actual key. Get that out of there. I'm not sure if that's for the key lock or if that's for that uh, removable hard drive. Let's put that to the side. And we can see it's an AT system. Got our 25 pin serial port here. The standard serial and parallel ports here. Got a NIC and a very odd looking video card. And another NIC. Oh yeah, this thing was definitely doing some kind of server duty for having two NICs. All right, let's find out what this key is for. Let's try the key lock and nope doesn't even fit in there. So it's gotta be for this drive bay. And yep, sure is. Oh, that's very nice to have. All right, let's open this beast up. Just gonna slide this back. And looks like that removable hard drive is IDE. Looks like a socket seven motherboard. And the fan is very sticky. All right, we got quite a bit of nastiness down here. A giant dust bunny filled with insect carcasses. Gross. Let's get the rest of that nastiness out of there. All right, let's see what kind of CPU that is. And there we go. That is an Intel Pentium something. Looks like a Pentium 1 MMX. Let's go ahead and pull that out of there. And indeed it is, Intel Pentium 1 with MMX technology. And all the pins look good. Looks like it might be 233 megahertz. Let's get that back in there. I'm just gonna go ahead and take that heatsink out of there because I gotta work on this fan. And also got some jankiness here. Looks like they just spliced the uh, fan connector onto a regular Molex adapter and we got Uninsulated wires just hanging in the breeze there. So I'm gonna go ahead and fix that up properly. All right, got that fan bearing fixed up. Also fixed up the wiring with some heat shrink and soldering. Yep, runs like a dream. Now, of course, you only have one speed, so it's gonna be kind of annoyingly noisy, but I don't see anywhere on this motherboard that has an actual CPU fan header, so we're not gonna get variable speed anyway. Now I'll clean up that CPU in preparation for a new thermal pad. Same deal for the heatsink. All right, let's get that heatsink back on. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this cross brace here, because it looks like it is removable. That'll give us some better access. There we go. All right, let's get these cables out of here. Well, for as big as this case is, we sure got some tight clearances up here. All right, let's check out that video card. Got an S3 Verge. Now that's interesting. Looks like it takes an external MPEG decoder. 
Whoever built this thing is sure was serious about their warranty stickers. These things are everywhere. Now let's check out that first NIC. And it's an Intel NIC. Made in Ireland. Now let's check out that second NIC. And it's a good old Realtek. RTL 8029 chipset. Yep, that's where the internet goes. And here's a good look at the motherboard chipset in the BIOS. And there's our fan header. So I'll definitely be replacing this uh, fan with a actual proper variable speed fan. And look how beefy that VRM is. That heatsink is massive. Let's go ahead and preemptively replace that CMOS battery. It's just a regular 2032. And yep, pretty dead. All right, and we are fully populated with 72 pin SIM modules, possibly EDO. And luckily these SIM slots have the metal retaining clips, so they don't tend to break as easily. So let's go ahead and get those out of there. And no indication of the size, but it looks like it's probably 16 megabytes. Let's take a look at the other one. Looks like the same. And third one. Also same. And finally, same, same. And this also accepts DIMM modules, so this is most likely a Super Socket 7 motherboard. All right, got all the RAM stick edge connectors cleaned up, so let's get them back in there. All right, let's get this power supply disconnected because we're going to interrogate it. You know, somehow the potential for a smoke show is not nearly as thrilling when the power supply is almost at your face level, but let's see what happens. All right, fan spun right up. Sacrificial hard drive is singing its usual song. And all voltages check out, so let's see if this thing boots. Oh, I think the sacrificial hard drive has finally had enough. All right, let's get a good look at that hard drive. Looks like we just slide this top plate. And there it is. Got a Western Digital Caviar, 13.6 gigabytes, with a manufacture date of December 1999. Sure hope we're Y2K compliant. All right, let's get that back in there. All right, got all drives reconnected. Also reinstalled all the peripheral cards in their original spots. So let's see what it does. Oh, they had the uh, display configured. Let's see, I'm sure it doesn't do any digit switching. Nope. Okay, I didn't hear that hard drive spin up. Let me try that one more time and listen carefully. It's making a very faint clicking sound. And the machine did post and counted the correct amount of RAM, but it did not detect the hard drive. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pull that hard drive out of this little caddy, see if I can get it to work. All right, drive, it's just you, me, and a power supply. Let's see what you got. Ew, that's not good. All right, well, clearly the heads are stuck. It's also making a pretty terrible grinding sound. I don't know if you can hear that. It sounds like the bearings are pretty well clearanced. All right, let's shut it off and try one more time. Well, I think we have a candidate for the next sacrificial hard drive. Give it a little thump. Oh yeah, it didn't like that. Well, that sucks. I was hoping to see what kind of server this thing might have been. All right, let's pop the lid and see what this thing's deal is. Well, I don't see much carnage right off the bat. Let's spin it up. And yep, there ain't nothing we can do for this drive. That thing is dead dead. Oh well. Oh yeah, just listen to that spindle motor bearing. Terrible. 
Okay, next issue is, looks like the multiplier is set incorrectly because I'm pretty sure that's a 233 MHz CPU. So let's take a look at that. Okay, well I don't see any jumpers or dip switches for setting the multiplier on the motherboard, so it must be configured in the CMOS. Let's see. Aha, uh -huh, CPU soft menu. There it is. I wonder how high it can go. Oh, that's for setting it manually. Let's just stick with the default 233. Save and exit setup. Yeah, there we go. Alright, let's try a DOS boot disk. Uh, can't see what that says. Do something maybe? Okay, that was weird. Guess that floppy drive just needed some time to figure its life out. And it did load the driver for the CD drive. Let's see if that CD drive opens. Oh, just barely. That is very stuck. Now that could be the stickiest CD tray I've ever felt. Let's give it some exercise. Oh, oh, starting. Starting to come back to life. Alright, let me just give that a quick de-dusting. Now, let's see if it reads a disk. I hear the laser lens clicking, but it's not spinning up. Alright, well that drive's going to need some attention. Alright, we see it's an Acer drive. Manufactured date August 1996. Let's get this thing open and see what's up with it. Oh no, my warranty. All right, got it opened up. Let's see what's going on. Okay, well, so we're not spinning the disc. I do hear the laser. Okay, we might just have a bad spindle motor. This is a cool old drive, so I'd really like to save it. Okay, so the laser lens doesn't look very dirty, but let's try cleaning it. Let's see what that gets us. And yeah, still no spin. All right, I went ahead and greased up the CD tray mechanism, so let's see if we get any better results. Oh yeah, that's working better. Okay, let's see if the laser's even firing. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, well, let's check out the spindle motor and see what's going on with it. Okay, so this is the flex for the spindle motor. And I noticed it had a little crease here, but I checked continuity and everything's good. I do get voltage readings from the board side, and I do get resistance readings from the motor side, so not quite sure what's going on here. Every once in a while, it will spin, but it just gives up. So at this point, I'm thinking the spindle motor and its control circuits are fine. There might just be a little bit of dust deep down in the laser lens, because if the laser can't detect a disc, it will not attempt to spin. And that laser assembly does not look easy to non-destructively disassemble, so as much as I hate to give up on a mid-90s CD drive, I might just have to move on from this one. And you're not going to believe it, but this little spring went sproinging across the garage not once, but twice. And I found it both times, which is nothing short of a miracle. Alright, well, into the long-term projects pile it goes. All right, well, I swapped in a known working CD drive, so we're going to see if old Nopix 3.8 can tolerate 64 megs of RAM. All right, got the Nopix splash screen. Let's go ahead and boot. Okay, doesn't like the video mode. Well, just continue. Okay, well, it's booting. Okay, well, apparently we're not getting into KDE, but Linux is running. And of course, we don't have any disks available for a swap file. It would be painfully slow anyway. Let's just get a shell. Okay, detected both of those NICs. Okay, looks like it's trying to start X anyway. 
Not enough memory to start KDE. So it looks like it just dropped us in the X term. But hey, it booted. Okay, well, partial success on this machine. Had a couple of dead drives, but the motherboard's perfectly healthy. Power supply is nice and functional, and all the peripheral cards seem to work. So let's go ahead and put this thing back together and move on to the next system. All right, this is one of the systems I've been dying to check out. I cannot wait to see what all these quarter-inch jacks are about. And in addition to that, we've got a Caddy-based CD burner. Looks like it's in excellent condition. However, unfortunately, I do not have a Caddy for it. I did order one from eBay, but it hasn't gotten here yet. And hopefully it gets here by the time I'm done shooting this video because I really want to test this thing. Now it's pretty hard to fit this giant thing in the frame, but the back side of this machine is equally ridiculous. See, we've got provisions for cooling fans up here. It is an ATX system. We've got some kind of video card. And this must be related to that Yamaha AX44 up in the front. We've got six RCA jacks over here. And it looks like it has a SCSI card. And here's a better look at those peripheral cards. Okay, now I gotta figure out how to get into this monster. Looks like this top panel has to come off first. Guessing this slides, maybe? There we go. Okay, and from here, it should just be like any old ATX case. Slide this back, maybe. Ain't getting far, there we go. Wow, this thing has to slide all the way off. So much room for activities. All right, and we are powered by a Pentium 2 slot one motherboard. Let's go ahead and pull that out of there. And there it is. Fan feels good. Edge connector looks clean. Let's just leave this out for right now. So I'm really struggling to fit this giant thing in frame, but we have four additional 3.5 inch drive bays here, up at the top above the power supply. Floppy drive lives up there. And we've got an IDE hard drive down here. So that SCSI card must have been for external storage. This thing's giving me strong professional audio vibes. Okay, let's just go ahead and get this IDE cable out of here. And apart from some cobwebs, this thing is really amazingly clean inside. Okay, I've got to start with this Yamaha card. This is the connector for the drive bay panel. Let's go ahead and put that up there. Wow, look at the size of those chips. Yamaha digital mixing card, DS2416. Got a date of 1998 on that chip. Back side of this card is equally impressive. And of course, here's the IO section. Nothing but RCA jacks. Let's just put that in a safe spot. All right, let's get a look at this SCSI card. And it is an Adaptec card. Looks pretty SCSI. This is very cool to have. All right, let's see what kind of video card they got in this thing. Standard issue Trident card. Very nice. All right, let's get that battery replaced. All right, let's get a look at that hard drive. And it is a Fujitsu drive, date stamp in 1998. Looks like it's the 6.4 gigabyte version. And I really hope this thing works because I am dying to know what kind of software they were using with all that audio hardware. So let's just get that back in there. All right, let's go ahead and disconnect all power. All right, let's have a look at that RAM. So we got 128 megs, no indication of speed. Let's check out the other one. This looks like a very similar stick. And no indication of size on this module at all. All right, I'm gonna clean up the edge connectors and get this RAM back installed. All right, right at face level. Here we go. So the lights in the shop went dim for just a millisecond. Power supply tester is not happy about it. Looks like we got some pretty wacky voltages. So let's connect a couple of sacrificial hard drives and see if that changes with any load. 
All right, we've got the duet here. Power on. Okay, well, voltages look a little better. Okay, well, I guess I can trust this power supply. All right, let's go ahead and get that Pentium 2 back in there. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and reinstall everything else then, see if this thing boots. All right, got everything back together. Let's see what it does. Okay, the hard drive spun up and hard drive's detected, as well as that CD drive. Let's continue. Apparently that SCSI card works. All right, it's booting. Hey, it's got Windows 95. Okay, whatever that is. Uh-oh. Good old Windows 95. Change the slightest bit of hardware and it gets all confused. All right, confused about the monitor. Okay, let's not go away. Don't care. Man, this thing really wants a driver for that COM port. No, go away. And there's our Yamaha card. And another reboot. Hooray. All right, we are in. And yeah, I'm definitely seeing signs of professional audio use. We got all kinds of interesting stuff on here. Man, I don't even know where to begin. This thing has every audio program I've ever heard of on here. Except Audacity. I guess this might be too old for Audacity. All right, let's get in the Cubase. Uh-oh. Oh, I don't have the license key. Oh, you know what? It's a hardware key. If you don't know, uh, certain programs need a hardware license key plugged in either to the USB port or, in this case, the parallel port. Well, I guess we're not using Cubase. Well, let's try old Sonic Foundry. Well, that's got a license key. All right, let's try to record something. All right, it's taking input from the DS2416. I think that's port number one. Obviously, I don't have anything connected to it. Let's just see if we get noise. Let's see if we can zoom. Doesn't look like we have much of a noise floor. See what Cool Edit Pro is all about. See how cool it really is. Let's see, we should be able to record some noise. Okay, well it records nothing, as expected. But look how crazy low the noise floor is. You know what? I gotta try something. I apologize in advance for this. Quite enough of that. Okay, now I gotta get this wave file off of here. It's too big to fit on a disc. And for that, I'm gonna use my CF card to IDE adapter. And we just plug that straight into the motherboard and give it some power. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, look at that. There's like no noise whatsoever. That is amazing. Well, there is nothing old or obsolete about that sound card. That thing's amazing. All right, let's see what else this thing has on here. AOL 4.0, of course. Gotta open that up. <laughs> oh, God. AOL 4.0. Should AOL be my default internet application? <laughs> nah. Uh-oh. All right, I think we're gonna make it. Yep, this was back in the day when you had to restart for absolutely everything. Oh, the memories. Restart later. Wow, I haven't seen the AOL 4.0 interface in <laughs> decades. I've got a couple accounts on there. Let's see what they have in their favorites. No surprise, bunch of audio stuff. It's in my files, personal filing cabinet. Wow, this thing still has old emails on it. Gotta look at the email dialogue. <laughs> Gather around, kids. A long, long time ago, this is how we sent email. All right, that's enough AOL. Oh, I cannot resist. 
the AOL sounds. Let's see what this machine wants to play these with. Okay, apparently nothing. Okay. Recycle only supports 16 bit audio files. Well, that ain't happening. Okay, well, let's see if that floppy drive works. DOS boot disk in there. Well, it's not going well. And actually, the mouse cursor locked up. Okay, well, clearly something's very wrong with that floppy drive. Yep, frozen solid. I might have to reboot. I guess we'll see if it boots from floppy. Okay, it does indeed. No clue whatsoever what caused Windows 95 to lock up, but locking up is kind of Windows 95's thing, so... Okay, well, let's see if the floppy drive figured its life out. And looks like it did. Alright, that floppy drive's perfectly fine. Okay, let's exit into MS-DOS mode and do a surface scan of this hard drive. Alright, proceed to surface scan. Well, this is gonna take a while. Well, I think we're gonna make it. Alright, we got the scan disk seal of approval. And unfortunately, it looks like my CD Caddy is not going to arrive in time for this video, so I won't be able to test the CD drive, but we can at least take a look at it. Let's go ahead and get it out of there. Whoa, that is weird. The top of it's like perforated. And it looks like the logic board's on the top. You don't usually see CD drives like that. And here's a good look at the label. It's got a manufacture date of December 1997. This has to be a pretty early CD burner. I can remember CD burners being quite exotic in 1997. Okay, well, that's enough embarrassing myself with this system. All in all, this machine is still incredibly capable at the task for which it was built. Let's move on to the next system. And our final system is also the tallest of the three. It's about a half inch or 1.3 centimeters taller than the previous system. And we got some badges. You can see it's badged as a Pentium 2 and apparently has a Matrox graphics card. Also has a very nice complement of drives. Got our three and a half and five and a quarter inch floppy drives. Got a DVD-ROM and a 40 speed CD burner. And similar to the other case, we have a provision for additional cooling up here. It is an ATX system. And there's our graphics card with a TV out, got a NIC, got a Firewire card, and some kind of sound card, and also has a dial-up modem. And this thing has some very funky screws. These are actually thumb screws. Well, that's convenient. Okay, so it looks like this case opens up very similarly to the last system. If you remove this top piece, because it's holding these side panels captive. Pretty stuck. There we go. And that's funny, it's got a drive bay cover taped to the inside of the top. I guess this case does offer plenty of storage space. And just like the last system, gotta slide this entire panel off. If I can find a way to get hold of it. There we go. Okay, that is not a Pentium 2. That is what we call a slocket, or a slot slash socket. So that's gonna be either a Pentium 3 or a Celeron. So let's get that out of there and figure out what it is. Let me get rid of this power connector first. Let's unplug the CPU fan. And hopefully we can get this out of here without breaking these clips because they are very brittle. Yep, that's a slocket. All right, fan bearing's good. Let's go ahead and get that heat sink off of there. And it is Intel Pentium 3. Looks like 850 megahertz, 256 kilobytes of cache, and 100 megahertz front side bus. Let's go ahead and pull that out of there. And all the pins look good. Just go ahead and put it back. All 
And I'll go ahead and freshen up that thermal grease and get that CPU back in there. All right, got some fresh thermal grease and the heatsink de-dusted, so let's get this thing back in there. All right, so this is weird. In addition to the onboard IDE, we also have an IDE PCI card. They must have had a lot of drives in this thing. Let's go ahead and pull these cables out of here. All right, let's get a look at that graphics card. Okay, that is not a Matrox card. It doesn't say what it is, but it looks like an NVIDIA card. And yep, indeed it is. Looks like an NVIDIA GeForce 4 MX420. Very nice. We might have us a turnkey retro gaming PC here. And here's a good look at the IO shield. Yeah, I love that purple PCB. This thing's pretty. All right, let's put that in a safe spot. And at last, we get to check out a sound card. And it is a Creative CT4740. Doesn't have a specific name. I imagine it's some kind of sound blaster. Here's a good look at the IO shield. And here's a good look at the chips. All right, let's put that to the side. All right, let's see what's going on with this IDE card. Yep, that's an IDE card. I'm sure this thing will prove itself useful to me one day. All right, let's have a look at that NIC. And it's a 3Com NIC. Looks like 10100. Always useful. All right, let's check out that FireWire card. And yep, it's a FireWire card. I'm sure it will come in handy one day. And finally, the dial-up modem. Looks like a Lucent. Looks like it's from 1996. It's quite an old modem to be in this case. And looks like it's a 56K modem. That is fancy. All right, let's check out that RAM. Let's get these cables out of here. Okay, what in the world is going on here? What is this even? Looks like it connects to the 12 volt rail. So they just got 12 volts just dangling around insulated by a plastic bag. Why? <laughs> Why? Okay, well, it's a PC100 stick. No indication of size. All right, let's check out the next one. I don't know what it is with RAM manufacturers and not making it perfectly clear what the size is. All right, let's check out the next one. And again, no indication of size. So we're just gonna have to guess and see what it counts up to. All right, got all those edge connectors cleaned up, so let's get that RAM back in there. This still kills me. <laughs> all right, let's disconnect power from all these drives. Now let's give that power supply a test. Shield your eyes. All right, spun right up. And I didn't bother to disconnect this exhaust fan up here, and it's running perfectly happily. Sacrificial hard drives out here being the heroes once again. And we are reasonably okay on voltage, so I think we're good. Let's just go ahead and get rid of old Sparky here. Now, unfortunately, this machine does not have a hard drive, so we're not going to be able to see if it has any games on it, which is too bad because I'm pretty sure this was somebody's gaming computer. Let's go ahead and replace that most likely dead CMOS battery. Yep, super dead. This could be the most annoying CR2032 socket I've ever seen. All right, I found some more jankiness. They're using fine pitch screws in this five and a quarter inch drive. Those are always fun to get out. And fortunately, they didn't wreck the threads. All right, let's go ahead and put this thing back together and see if it boots. All right, here we go. Power on. Well, something's making an incredibly high-pitched whine. And we got no post. 
This motherboard might be a victim of the capacitor plague. Let's see if these CD drives open. <laughs> Very reluctantly. One more time. Oh, I just need some exercise. Let's try the DVD drive. Yeah, that one opens like a champ. Nope, it doesn't close though. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Maybe you can't. We got some gear mesh issues going on in there. Oh, it's coming back to life. Oh. There we go. Alright, simplest thing first. Let's get those peripheral cards back out of there. Let's see if it'll at least complain about having no video card. Nope, not even a little bit. That speaker is definitely connected. All right, let's see what the post analyzer card has to say. That thing's gonna be impossible to read in this giant thing. Well, you can kind of see it. Power on. I think that motherboard is dead dead. The CPU is just ever so slightly warm. So it's definitely getting power. Well, let's see if it complains about having no RAM. Not even a little bit. Well, the chipset is warm. Okay, I'm really not getting far with the troubleshooting, so let's go ahead and rule one thing out. Let's try a known good power supply. All right, I got the video card and the RAM back in. Let's see what it does. Aha! That was it. You know, I'm really confused by that because that power supply tested good. That thing's counting up a lot of RAM. It's counting it very slowly. Well, that has a weird amount of RAM, but hey, it's working. Okay, well, let me go ahead and reconnect with disk drives. All right, got all drives reconnected. Power on. All right, let's go ahead and go and set up. Well, this thing has WinBIOS 2? I'm finding a lot of machines with this BIOS on it. Okay, well, I don't have a mouse connected, so I'm just gonna use the keyboard. Let's just make sure the floppy drives got detected. Okay, that one's good. I'm guessing that's the B drive. Let's go ahead and set that. And the other drive should auto detect, so let's go ahead and exit. Save changes and exit. All right, go ahead and insert a DOS boot disk. Hey, it works. And got both CD drives. All right. Now I don't think it detected that five and a quarter inch drive. Oh, maybe it did. Let me get a disc in there. Oh, doesn't stay latched. Well, you know what? I wonder if it'll work if I hold it. And that's a no. I know that disc is formatted. Okay, well, I guess that drive needs some attention. Fail. Go back to A drive. All right, well, let's try the DVD drive. Yeah, things are already working better. Okay, now I think it got assigned R drive. Let's see, maybe. Nope, let's try the other one. I think it was S drive. Hey, there it is. That thing works. All right, it's always nice to have an IDE DVD drive around. Okay, well, let's try the CD burner. Open very slowly. Now that one should definitely be R drive. And it works. Oh, look at that, both optical drives work. All right, let's pull out that five and a quarter inch drive and see if we can help it. You're janked in there. What is this thing catching on? There we go. Okay, so it looks like this little cam mechanism is broken. So you've got a crack there where it rides on the shaft. So it can't really push down the little spindle. 
Okay, so it looks like it's supposed to kick this out. All right, well, we got some real broken stuff in here, but I wonder if I can hold it in this position, if it'll work. All right, let's see. Aha, that drive does work. Yep, there's all those files we copied last week. Okay, well, I guess I just have to figure out how to fix that little cam mechanism. This drive will be perfectly fine. Why, yes, I am gonna to attempt to boot Nopix on this machine. How did you know? This is the latest version of Nopix, so we're gonna see how well modern Linux runs on this machine. Go ahead and put it in the CD burner because I think that's configured as the master because it got assigned the lower drive letter. All right, looks like it's booting. Ooh, that's a noisy old CD drive. We might get the full 40 speeds. If you've never heard a high-speed CD-ROM drive run at full speed before, they sound absolutely terrifying. It sounds like the disc is gonna explode. All right, we're gonna make it to the graphical environment, it looks like. Initiated startup sequence. And that was the Nopix startup sound, which means that sound card works. All right, we are there. Okay, looks like we're stuck in 640 by 480 mode, but let's go ahead and open a terminal. Oh, <laughs> that thing is giant. All right, let's see our resolution options. Yep, 640 by 480 is all we get. All right, now let's test that graphics card. Should be able to run GLX gears, assuming that's still a thing. Aha, and it is. And we can see we're getting stable frame rates, which means 3D acceleration on this GPU is working. All right, well, we just confirmed that the video card and the sound card are good, so that's good enough for me. Let's go ahead and shut down. Initiating shutdown sequence. And there's the shutdown sound. Okay, well, apart from that floppy drive being a little broken and getting head faked by a faulty power supply, this machine is perfectly fine. You know, I really need to build or buy a proper power supply tester. You know, one that'll actually put a load on the power supply because my current testing methods just aren't cutting it. I need to design my own tester anyway because I cannot for the life of me find a commercially available AT power supply tester. It seems like they're all centered on ATX. So if you know of any, please let me know in the comments. All right, well, I am definitely gonna be making use of this device. I don't know if I'll keep it in this case though because it's kind of ridiculous but it would be so cool to have an audio recording rig based on retro hardware. And I just want to go ahead and express my eternal gratitude to everyone who's subscribed and pledged their support on Patreon. I'm going to do my best to try to upload a video every week at least. So if you're new to the channel and you like this kind of content, be sure to subscribe. So I've got a lot more coming. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.